kind of turn a corner here in Matthew's gospel and up to this point we've kind of started with the birth of Jesus or the genealogy through the birth through all the moving around to he begins his ministry uh, as we saw last week part of that was the fulfillment of prophecy moving down to Capernaum on the edge of the Sea of Galilee and then formally calling we saw his uh, first disciples and obviously there'll be uh, others after that having called them then what uh, Matthew does is he Again, groups information together, not chronologically, but topically. So starting in chapter 5, he puts together a whole body of teaching uh, of Jesus, beginning with what we refer to as the Sermon on the Mount or, or the Beatitude. Sermon on the Mount because he goes up to a mountainside uh, above the Sea of Galilee and does the teaching there. We'll see that in verse 1. The Beatitudes, because uh, Beatitude comes from a, a Latin word, uh, where uh, that is a translation or a transliteration of the word blessed. And uh, as each of these start out, blessed are you if you do do this and, and so forth. Then uh, this will happen or this will be the benefit in, in, in your relationship uh, with the Lord. So there's a couple of things that are going on here in terms of dy a dynamic. I think for us, the thing to see at the outset, uh, I mean, we see this on cards. We see it on framed, you know, calligraphy, uh, and stuff, and we have a tendency to look at these things. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the peacemakers, and so forth. Blessed are the pure in heart. And uh, I've even heard some teaching that, and this is the way it will be someday. This is the way it will be in the millennial kingdom of God. Someday we'll all be like this. <clears throat> it doesn't exactly say that in the text. <clears throat> Basically, he he's calls his disciples and said, "Here's what you're supposed to be like." So I really think it's a teaching on genuine discipleship, uh, who is really a, a truly a, a follower of, uh, of Jesus Christ. It's not something for, the, um, for, for later on, some, some uh, you know, by and by kind of a thing. It's, it's really where we should be in our, our relationship with the Lord right now. He is going to lay out what deals with uh, character, the internal uh, person, because he's dealing with uh, the prevalent teaching of the day of the Pharisees, which was everything was about conduct. Everything was about the outward. Everything was about what you did for show and so forth. These guys had all the appearance in the world of righteousness, but as he would say later, inside their hearts, they're like graves, you know, uh, men's rotting bones inside. Didn't exactly have flattering things to say to the Pharisees. So he's trying to deal with that, teach his own guys now that I've called you, this is really what you should be like internally, your character, as opposed to uh, the Pharisees. Um, now, once he gets to the, 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 the character part in this section, as we get next week, he'll start dealing with the conduct. If the internal life is correct, and uh, then you can be a, a city that's set on a hill. You can be the new wine put in the new wineskin. You can be the all the things that are the outward that he'll deal with on into chapter 5, 6, and 7. And then he'll culminate in chapter 7, again, with the, the backdrop of the Pharisees being around, with the idea, then he'll say, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. It's, it's just, it's not the external religion of the Pharisees who ne showed no mercy and so forth, we're not peacemakers. We're not pure in heart. They're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. In fact, Jesus would say to them, uh, I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow. <laughs> so the righteousness that God is looking for is different than what was 
exhibited in the life of the Pharisees. So uh, there's teaching and, and tremendous contrast going on with what was the accepted standard of the day. There's teaching that deals here first with character, uh, and, and that's got to be foundational before you get to, uh, to conduct. Uh, this is also an example of what we mentioned last week of Jesus teaching with authority. As we go through the teaching of Jesus, Jesus is not quoting other rabbinical teachers. We mentioned how uh, they said this about him because uh, the teaching of that day, rabbis would teach, and uh, to teach with authority, only God had authority, so they would teach in the second person all the time. Um, Rabbi so-and-so says this, Rabbi Gamaliel says this, and that's how they would teach. They'd never say, and I said this, or this is the way it is. But that's what we see with Jesus. When he speaks with authority and says, blessed are you when this happens, Jesus, as we'll see, and I'll give you a few examples, he's drawing from the Psalms. He's drawing from Isaiah. When he's going to support what he says, he says it with the word of God. Uh, so one of the things that we kind of miss is that we read the Beatitudes. We don't exactly have the bulk of the Old Testament memorized. Anybody have the bulk of the Old Testament memorized? So when he says a phrase, it doesn't like ring a bell with us as it did with them. They would recognize that Jesus has the ability to pull from this psalm and this psalm and this passage from Isaiah, condense them and say, and, and this is how it applies to you. This is what you should be like. And they go, wow, nobody teaches like that with authority, right from God's word, how he's able to do it. It becomes indicative of, of the apostles Paul's teaching as well. we see often in the uh, epistles uh, as well. He kind of concludes this whole section with the parable of the, the wise and the foolish builder. The wise man builds his house on the rock. The foolish man builds his house on, on the sand. Not everyone's going to enter the kingdom of God. So internally, in terms of character, who is a genuine believer? Who is a genuine disciple of, of Jesus Christ? And as I mentioned, uh, this formula is used throughout the psalm. Psalm 1, 1, blessed is the man. There's our phrase again. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. Psalm 32, blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him and in whose spirit is no deceit. Psalm 41, blessed is he who has regard for the weak or the poor. Uh, the Lord delivers him in times of trouble. You'll be blessed by doing this because of this. So it's, it's a very common formula of teaching for them. Now one more word before we get in, and that's this idea of the word, what does the word blessed mean? Some modern translations actually translate the word happy. Happy are you if you do this. If you think that makes sense, what do you think about them in the Old Testament when they would say, blessed are you, Lord God, maker of heaven and the earth? Are they, are they saying, Lord, hope you're happy today? You know, I, that's not the meaning of the word blessed. Um, yeah, some, some maybe a good definition would be um, a divine internal joy. I mean, are you happy when you're persecuted and you're reviled and people insult you? No, no. Because <laughs> happiness comes from the word, Anglo-Saxon word, happenstance. Uh, that means circumstances. This week, Kathy got home. She goes, I think you better take a look at the car. The good car. It's making funny noises. The last time I had a good car that made funny noises, it was because the piston had gone through the block. So, you know, when you hear this clink, 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 clink things going on, it's, it just it sends chills down my spine. Turn the engine off. <laughs> it makes a strange noise. I turn the engine off very quickly. And I said, I'm going to... Okay, don't touch it. Don't touch it. You know, check all the fluids first. You know, I wasn't really happy at the moment. <laughs> but then I went out the next morning when there was a little light, began to check a little things. Ah, oh, it was just a little plastic fan blade behind the radiator that had gotten uh, uh, loose a little bit, was kind of wobbling. Ah, oh, I was happy again. <laughs> 99 cent part, no problem. Happiness, happenstance. We're up and we're down. That has nothing to do with being blessed. Uh, blessing is, uh, is an internal divine joy, um, a security, a calling, a sense that God gives you so that even in the worst of persecution, you, you still have something internally that holds you together because you know that there's more than this life, that you'll be rewarded in heaven and so on and, and so forth. So again, the word blessing has nothing to do with circumstances uh, and with happiness. 
Let's go ahead and read our, our text now, the first 12 verses of Matthew 5. Now, when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, so who is he teaching? Not the crowds, but his disciples. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those are the eight Beatitudes. Verse 11 and 12 give us the application of that last Beatitude about persecution. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were uh, before you. I've kind of broken this down to uh, four principles uh, Jesus didn't do that. I did. But uh, again, sometimes it helps us to kind of hopefully remember things and, and see the, the big picture of what Jesus is teaching. But um, verses 1 to 5, this I, idea of, of uh, those that mourn, uh, those that are meek, and so forth. Some people could look at those as being, uh, being a negative as opposed to those that you do, show mercy and being a peacemaker and so forth uh, at the end, with kind of a middle of the uh, hungering and thirsting for, for righteousness. I, I've broken it down there a little bit. I, um, I think these first uh, five verses uh, can be seen one of two ways. One is to see it, these are a prerequisite for anybody that comes to the Lord. Uh, if you haven't experienced these things as part of your salvation, the foundation of your salvation experience, and, uh, and we'll kind of uh, enumerate them in a moment, then you might wonder what happened. You know, and, and certainly we all know people who, who seem to have raised their hand or gone forward at this or said this or whatever. Uh, they, uh, th there doesn't seem the, the glue of the gospel that really sticks or whatever. And, uh, and we can't really see much fruit from their lives and so forth. And what I want to suggest as we go through that, maybe you'll agree with me, this is a real element that's missing in, in the gospel. Uh, this foundational teaching that Jesus says this is for his disciples and how are they are to be in terms of their internal character. I think also, though, so none of us get uh, off uh, the hook here and go, well, I've already come to the Lord, so that doesn't apply for me. Uh, I, I've chosen to say uh, that there is a guard against pride in genuine discipleship. Uh, if you look at these things and you have them in your heart, it will guard you against pri pride. Uh, pride comes before a fall, not a good thing. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the Humble. It's not a good thing to be proud as, as a believer. And if we'll look at these things in that context, I think it'll help us. If you don't know the Lord, then look at them in terms of this, this is the way in. This is how you come into a relationship with the Lord. So the first one is we're uh, guarded against pride when we see ourselves as those who are poor in spirit. And uh, someone has said we've got to empty ourselves before we can be, uh, be full. The word poor here does not mean someone that does not have enough money, someone that does not have food. It's not talking about that kind of poor. Uh, it's talking about somebody uh, that actually has nothing in themselves of anything that is worthwhile. In Jesus' day, this word would not be used of a dog because the dog had some worth. So according to Jesus, a real guard against pride is to realize you are worth spiritually nothing. That's what Jesus said. I'm just kind of passing along the message to try to help make your day. Uh, and if we see ourselves that way, apart from Jesus Christ, Paul says, Paul, who is a great rabbinical teacher, studied under Gamaliel and so forth, said, in my flesh is no good thing. And he said, apart from Christ, I am nothing. He understood the Sermon on, on the Mount and how it, how it begins. It is the opposite of self-sufficiency. When you can understand how, how we're kind of bombarded with, with the idea, especially as being uh, uh, Americans, that we, uh, we're self-sufficient. We're the pioneers. You know, we cross the plains. We pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. That would be cowboy boots, bootstraps. John Wayne, you know, right there with them. Self-sufficiency. 
Uh, you know, and, and we often, even as Christians, try to emphasize the idea of personal responsibility, which is good. That's not the same as self-sufficiency. Uh, we, we need the Lord. And boy, that's why, you know, <laughs> reading through the Psalms and so forth, where, which this derives from, is such a good thing. You know, David, David was saying, uh, my hands can't even bend a bow without you, Lord. I can't even shoot the arrow. I would never go into battle. I couldn't make it without you, Lord. We come to faith in Christ when we realize that we are spiritually bankrupt. And why? Because we're, we're moving to a place of hungering and thirsting after God. If you begin to draw close to the Lord, like Peter, and we mentioned it last week, Peter gets the formal calling of, of Christ and then decides not to follow, goes back to fishing, and remember the story. And then Jesus comes and goes to the water edge, wants to teach, just happens to pick Peter's boat, get in the boat, has him shove off shore, and then teaches this message, captive audience with Peter, Peter's probably squirming in his seat the whole time. And then uh, he tells him, go out into the deep water during the day when you're not supposed to be able to catch fish. And Peter catches so much fish it fills both boats. Remember Peter's response, now I feel really sufficient. I'm a great fisherman. And that's not what he said, is it? He said, <laughs> he said, go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. All right. All right. Step one. <laughs> that, that's how we come to faith in Christ. I need the Lord. I need to for, be forgiven. Uh, big surf on the North Shore this, this weekend. Uh, there was even, uh, one, I was watching the news one night, there were five guys that were pretty much pros that even got, got rescued. You know how they got rescued? By going, help! <laughs> Nobody gets rescued uh, by going, I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> I've been there. It's so terrible. Uh, one day I was uh, drowning for sure in my younger days on the North Shore. And I'm just trying to get in, you know, and my board is washed. I think it ended up in Tahiti. And you know, you, can, you know, playing golf, you can lose a golf ball. I lost my surfboard. It got caught in a rip. I don't know where it went. It went to someplace else in the, in the ocean. And I'm trying to, way out there trying to get in. And I'm in a rip. And I swam in that rip till I had cramps in both of my legs before my pride would allow me to say, uh, uh, you guys think you can help me over here? <laughs> like I'm going to die if you don't? Humbleness. You know, realizing our bankruptcy, that's when we cry out to the Lord. And that will guard us against pride as believers. Matthew 18, 1 to 4, Jesus would go on later in this gospel and to his disciples saying, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child and had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth. Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Can you get into the kingdom of heaven without humbling yourself before God? Absolutely not, according to Jesus Christ. It's a prerequisite, but it's also a very important guard for us against pride to realize, man, Jesus says, you're going to have an intrinsic, internal, divine joy if you realize how bankrupt you really are. And you just look to me and depend upon me. But if you think you can do it on your own, if you think you can earn your own salvation, you think my dying on the cross was not sufficient for your salvation, you're going to have problems. Not only uh, in terms of coming to know me personally and having your sin forgiven, but in your walk with the Lord because I oppose the proud. Secondly, we're guarded against pride when we see ourselves as those who mourn. Again, this is a sin sincere uh, sorrow for sin, uh, my sin, and the sins of others. Uh, it's used nine times uh, in the New Testament. The other references are all references to people who are mourning for somebody that is very close to them. It's a mother, it's a father, it's a child, it's a brother who has died. Th those are the, the references. Uh, you can be blessed if you mourn over your own sin, like somebody that's just lost somebody they, they care greatly about. And that's a good thing. I mean... Um, uh, it, it should happen. If, if, if you can go out and, and, and plan your sin and then do it, and then do it on a regular basis, I'd really question your salvation. I'd really question it. And uh, uh, I know it's possible for people to come to faith in Christ and, and then do that. It's a, it's a slippery slope. 
Uh, that's right. The writer of Hebrews has all these warnings. We must pay more careful attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. It's not an overnight deal. It's just a, it's just a drift. It's a slow, slow drift. It's the image uh, of a boat that's in anchor, and the anchor has slipped away. It's not done on purpose. They, they don't know it's happening. Uh, it's a slow drift. And uh, again, it should be when we sin, when we realize our sin, because something we hear in a teaching, something we have explained in the Word, something we're reading on our own, something the Lord just shows us, and a song that we sing or whatever it might be, man, there should be sorrow because we're breaking God's heart. And we think of how much he loves us and what he's, uh, what he's done for us. Now, again, Jesus, again, is drawing from a passage in Isaiah. Isaiah 61, 1 says, uh, uh, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. That's the same idea in the Hebrew there. Um, and again, and he goes on and talks about setting the captives free and those that will be released from darkness, uh, from prisons and so forth. And Jesus ends up quoting that uh, later in, in the gospel. But uh, easy to get careless about sin, uh, make our excuses for it. We need to recognize it breaks God's heart. And, uh, and at the same time, realize there's a real distinction between what Paul says is godly sorrow versus worldly sorrow. 2 Corinthians uh, uh, 7, he talks about how uh, godly sorrow leads to uh, uh, repentance that brings salvation. And he says it leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow, he says it brings death. And the classic example would be, same situation, Peter uh, denies the Lord. And then he's weeping and crying over it, brokenhearted over it, especially when he realizes what Christ is going through on his behalf. And, uh, and Christ comes to him in his brokenness and his sorrow for his sin, and he's reconciled and he's restored. Judas weeps over the circumstances, the same circumstances as well, sorry that things turned out that way, and he kills himself. That's exactly what Paul is saying. There's a real difference between I'm sorry for me because my thing didn't work out the way I wanted as opposed to my heart is broken over the Lord. I remember uh, I heard uh, another pastor teaching one time about trying to deal with his teenage son o over an issue where he could just see him kind of an attitude thing. I mean, he was walking with the Lord, but he could kind of see him drifting. And he could see this kind of distance himself from, from his dad and from his dad's authority. He pretty much obeyed most of the time, but not all the time, and sometimes with an attitude. And he was really concerned. And he sat down with him and shared his concern uh, and everything and said, Son, I want you to do something. Now, give me, give me your hand and just kind of make, make your hand real, real loose like this. And which he did. And then he took his son's hand and he just, he, he whacked himself in the face very hard. Very hard. And uh, so that he was bleeding across his lip. And of course, his son's reaction was, Dad, Dad are you all right? I didn't, no, no. That's, I just wanted to uh, make a point here. See, every time you disobey me this way, every time you give me this attitude, that's what you're doing. You're slapping me in the face. And it's the same thing with God. And so we need to realize that and, and, and sorrow over our sin. You think that would keep you from being pride, prideful? I think that would help. I think that would help. How about the sin of others? Does that break your heart too? Do you begin to pray for them? Are you concerned? This is, this is discipleship 101. This is not graduate school. This is, he just calls the boys and says, sit down here on the lawn. I want to explain a few things to you. This is basic. This is right up front. Uh, and that, that's what he's going through here. The third thing we see, we're guarded against pride when we see ourselves as those who are, are meek. And uh, this is a quote from Psalm 37. I, um, I sometimes uh, hear uh, people say uh, 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 appropriately, meekness is not weakness. Uh, meekness is uh, power under control. I think that's a, a good definition. Sometimes I hear people say, uh, if you hyphenate it, M-E hyphenate E-K, me, ick. <laughs> that, that, that sounds good, but that kind of misses the point. Sometimes in the Greek language, to understand exactly what a, a, a word means, it's good to look at what the, the opposite of that word means. The opposite of meek is revenge. It's revenge. 
The person that is meek is a person that is not vengeful. Uh, when they're hurt or they are wronged, uh, they don't want to get their pound of flesh. They're not going to come back. Paul says this in Romans 12, 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil. That's uh, being meek. Uh, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, it's not always possible, but as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge. That's the cinnamon for, for our word we're looking at, my friends. But leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, uh, says the Lord. What does the world say today? Hey, you got your rights, man. I wouldn't let them get away with that. <laughs> right? <laughs> I, uh, I don't know if anybody else, I get caught in this so much. <laughs> so much. But uh, it's, it's easy to do. It's like, Lord, can I just trust you for this? It, it didn't go down the way it was supposed to. I'm kind of getting ripped off, <laughs> off here or whatever. Can I trust you to kind of work this thing out instead of me just lashing out and, uh, yeah, and so forth? Uh, again, it's, it should not surprise us that when God talks about the internal character of our lives, it's going to be the opposite in every case of everything the world would want to teach us and the philosophy uh, of this world. So again, I think these are great, very practical uh, guards against pride. They are the prerequisites for salvation. In coming to the Lord, if you've never been sorrowful over your own sin, You've never realized you are absolutely bankrupt. There's nothing you could possibly do to add to the cross of Jesus Christ and his blood that was shed for you. I would question whether you really got saved. I hear a lot of altar calls today that say, just come up, cross the big rainbow and have a better life. You know, I mean, I've heard some strange things that, that were purported to be the gospel. My concern is that people have some experience in a Christian context. They think they got it all and then go... They, I don't know if you ever heard that. I tried Christianity. It didn't work for me. I always say, what'd you try? You know, tell me what you tried. You know, and, and then sometimes it's, it's really not. It's really not the gospel. Uh, it's not this, you know, uh, what Jesus is laying out here in the Sermon on the Mount. Secondly, there's a pursuit of righteousness for the genuine disciple. Uh, again, our spiritual condition should cause us to pursue our hunger or thirst for righteousness. It's not a sinless perfection by any means, but it says, man, <laughs> if we've come to faith in Christ, we understand our brokenness, our dependence on him. There should be a, uh, uh, just a, a thirst, you know, an appetite for, for spiritual things. Uh, do you ever pray for people? Lord, I pray you'd give them a hunger for your word because you realize they're not really getting it. They're not really getting fed. They don't seem to be growing. They don't seem to be maturing. Like the verse we mentioned last week, like newborn babes crave, crave pure spiritual milk. That's the Bible. So that by it, you may grow up in, in your salvation. Uh, and and we, I pray that for people. I pray that for myself. Uh, we should be pursuing after, like somebody that's really hungering uh, after God and, and his righteousness. Is this a common theme of the Old Testament that Jesus is drawing for? As a deer pants for the water, so my thirst longs for thee. Tom quoted uh, uh, Proverbs earlier, you know, that uh, <clears throat> basically if we'll, you know, we'll seek hard after God, you know, he'll meet us. Uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. All your ways acknowledge him, and the Lord will direct your, your paths. James says in James uh, chapter 4, he says, he says, come near to God, and he will come near to you. I mean, and so it's all of these ideas that are everywhere in the Old Testament about hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Psalm 63 says, O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power in your glory. David, David writes, genuine discipleship, seeking hard after God. Because man, I'm nothing without Jesus. Uh, I just want to grow. I want to know more. I want to want to grow up because I want my conduct to really reflect Christ, and it starts with uh, character development. Uh, in now again, every time we talk about seeking after righteousness, sometimes we need a little explanation. Jesus is not saying we have to seek after a righteousness in terms of being righteous before. God, in terms of uh, eternal salvation, uh, we are positionally righteous when we come to faith in Christ. Uh, 
God bestows upon us the righteousness of, of Jesus Christ, gives us uh, the, the Holy Spirit in our lives, adopts us as his sons, calls us his children, and so forth. But uh, besides that positional, that place we have with Christ because of what he's done, certainly there can be a practical working out of, of righteousness. My own life, my daily habits, how I, how I live. This is all predicated upon, it's not, so let's adopt the, the 10 big do's and the 12 big don'ts and like the Pharisees, that's not what Jesus is saying. But he is saying, you know, if we'll really seek after God hard, <laughs> you know, the rest of this stuff uh, seems to take care of itself. Uh, and, uh, and, and Jesus is saying, uh, it's a blessing, you know, when, when you do that, when you're seeking after me. Uh, David said, said uh, 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 I'd rather have one day in, in your, your house or your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a, a doorkeeper, Lord, in your temple and worship you than being the wealthy of, of the tents that are, that are out there, even where the wicked are. Again, a very common theme, uh, you know, in, in the Psalms. This is a blessing, you know, when we're seeking uh, after the Lord. Uh, again, the reward, our spiritual pursuit is rewarded and we are filled. Jesus says they will be filled. Um, we realize our bankruptcy. We seek uh, after true righteousness and, and the Lord says he will, uh, will fill us. So there's uh, some things that uh, we can look at to uh, guard against pride. There's a pursuit of righteousness that belongs to the genuine disciple. And there's positive changes in a genuine disciple. And the first one is... Uh, this positive change will cause us to be merciful. Uh, again, this is not a, a, a legalism. I do this, I get this, but it is that reaping and sowing. Jesus says, as you show mercy to others, then you will be shown mercy yourselves. Yeah, but they don't deserve to be shown any mercy. No, that's what mercy is. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's giving them what they don't deserve. I have to be nice to that person. You know what they're like? Yeah, no, that's, no, we're not saying give them what they deserve. We're saying give them mercy. You know, it's, it's, two, it's two different things. Uh, again, what is mercy? It is a forgiving attitude towards those who fail. It's, it's a forgiving attitude towards those who, do people fail you all the time and, and bum you out or whatever? Yeah, what does God say? Don't let them get away with it. No, he says, show mercy. He says, you know what you're going to find? You're going to be blessed, man. You're, you know, you're going to find people showing you a ton of mercy. Do you, do you ever uh, get caught where you kind of get uh, judgmental about something and you're just, even in your mind, and you're, oh, that person, I can't, you know, and then you find yourself blowing it in the same way like the next day? Am I the only one that does that? God has a real sense of humor. You know, I mean, he doesn't let us, uh, it's a good thing. God keeps us on a short leash, you know, because he has a way through his word and stuff to go, go yeah, that person's right. Yeah, they really did that. Oh, they shouldn't have done that. Da, da, da. Say, Can I hold this little mirror here for you a second? Take a look inside. Oh, yeah, well, that's, you know, well they're not that bad, Lord. And, uh, you know, uh, we need to show mercy. <laughs> We're going to be shown more mercy, but uh, we need to do it because we need it. <laughs> Uh, I think we appreciate it when somebody else uh, shows us a little mercy and doesn't give us what we, what we deserve. Uh, the positive change will also cause us to be pure in heart. This means a singleness of heart, not a divided heart between God and, and the world. It's not a sinless heart, but it's pursuing after, after truth. Uh, it's not that... Uh, um, uh, I'm seeking God, but also something else. Now, this is from Psalm 24. I want to read it to you, uh, and you'll see that here the psalmist is talking about uh, I can either be seeking after God or idolatry, uh, one, or, one or the two. Psalm 24, verse 3, Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false, he will receive a blessing from the Lord. Uh, that's, that's our proverb right, right there. And vindication from God, his Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of, of Jacob. Uh, so important that uh, we have this singleness of heart, that uh, we have a pure devotion to the Lord. David said to uh, uh, search my heart and know me in, uh, several times in Psalm 139. And sometimes we, we need the Lord and we need to pray that, that he would show us. Because we want to have a, a singleness of heart, a pure heart towards, towards the Lord. Uh, the third positive change is to cause us to be peacemakers. Uh, again, 
Paul says that uh, uh, that should be easy. We got the gospel of feet, uh, the gospel of peace on our feet <laughs> wherever we go. We should be uh, peacemakers. It's not peace at any price. Uh, we have to continue to contend for the gospel. It's not compromising our faith for the sake of making peace with someone. But as he said in Romans 12, as far as it be possible with you. Some people are just contentious. They do not want to have any peace with you. But as far as it's possible with you, uh, you know, be a, be a peacemaker. Because after all, if you think about it, all these characteristics speak of Jesus Christ. The ultimate peacemaker, the ultimate and pure heart, and, uh, and, and so forth. And he is the prince of peace. We're his representatives. And um, I think these things, sometimes we just need to pray, obviously, that God would just help us to be able to do these things. Got a little practical suggestion. You might start with your, your word, own words. Proverbs 12, 25, an anxious heart is weighed, weighs a man down, but a kind word cheers him up. Proverbs uh, 15, 23, a man finds joy in giving an apt reply. How good is a timely word? Proverbs 15, 1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. You know, one of the ways that we can be peacemakers is certainly sharing the gospel of peace and the prince of peace and the good news of Christ with others, but it kind of starts with an internal character so it can be worked out in terms of our conduct and one of those ways is, is with the words we speak. Of course, Jesus said, <laughs> it's out of the heart that the mouth speaks. So you can't just be a Pharisee and go, oh, memorize a couple of them proverbs and just kind of spit them out on people once in a while. That's not it. We need to pray that the Lord would, would uh, do a work in our hearts so that even when there's a situation that can be a little testy, that we'll see that, Man, I can either stir this thing up and make it worse, or I can give a kind word, an apt reply to kind of, you know, mellow, mellow things out here a little bit. But uh, God calls us as disciples to be peacemakers with others. And in the church, he says this uh, in terms of believers. Paul says in Ephesians 4, 2, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So in the body of Christ, we're, man, we need, we need peacemakers. I heard one writer said, said that uh, uh, to, sometimes to, to have peace, you have to build a bridge to somebody. And that bridge ought to be built out of a wooden cross. In other words, it's Christ gives us a new nature. He gives us forgiveness. He gives us all these things. He gives us peace, and we should be able to extend peace and mercy and so forth uh, to those that we come contact on a regular basis, certainly uh, those within the body of Christ. So here in the Beatitudes, there's a guard against pride. Uh, there's a pursuit of righteousness, positive changes that should come about uh, in our lives. And the fourth one, the one you've been looking for, Yes, there will be persecution in genuine discipleship. It's not an if, it's not a maybe, it's a this will be a normal byproduct of walking with the Lord. And one of the reasons for that is um, as, as you read through these, it's always uh, uh, blessed are you if you do this. And if you look at the first beatitude and the last beatitude, it will say for the kingdom of God is theirs. That word in the Greek for for is really because. We will, blessed are you when people persecute you because you have the kingdom of God. You're in the kingdom of God. Uh, people don't persecute you for Jesus' sake because you're thinking about becoming a Christian. <laughs> they, they persecute you because you've come to faith in Christ and yours is the kingdom of God. Uh, it's not something by and by in the future. It's something that we embrace and have right now as we bow our knee to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. As Matthew is pointing out, there will be a kingdom that is coming in terms of Jesus coming back to planet Earth, establishing his millennial reign here and so forth. But for believers, it's something we enter into now. Uh, Paul says that Timothy, Peter makes reference to the fact that um, if you're godly, you'll suffer, Paul says. Peter says, don't be surprised when you fall into fiery trials. Uh, and as I mentioned, that's the, the beatitude that working out is in verse 11 and, and 12. Uh, again, but Jesus teaches that uh, in the midst of persecution, people uh, falsely accusing you and some of the other things that he's mentioned, uh, these are things that are happening because of our relationship with the Lord, uh, and it can be a blessing. We're not happy about it, 
but it still can be a blessing. Paul says he, he was so transfixed on wanting to grow in his relationship with the Lord. And here's a guy that suffered tremendously, obviously. And, uh, and yet he said that, uh, you know, I want to know Christ. And I want to know the, the fellowship of his suffering. And so somehow to be conformed like him. Wow. The fellowship of his suffering. If you think about it, it's kind of a unique thing. If we've never been persecuted, if we've never suffered, can we share in that experiential relationship, that part of Christ? Did Christ suffer? Tremendously on our behalf. If we've never suffered, can we, do we have that element of a relationship with him? It's just interesting. Um, the guys here, they're in the military that have gone off to war and so forth. Uh, if, if they've had some, some very difficult times in the battlefield, those guys, never, ne never done it, only done men's kayak trips. Never, never done it, which is also life-threatening. Uh, never done it, but the idea of a bond that is formed because of uh, a, a dramatic experience that is o only can be shared by those that partnered in it. It's a bond that they, they have, and you know, I've heard uh, a lot of the older guys from World War II and stuff talk about it, as well as some of the younger, younger guys that are uh, going out to uh, fight uh, the terrorists uh, today. Uh, it's a unique experience. Uh, Paul says there's something about suffering for Christ's sake that's a blessing, because there's something that changes in my relationship, because now I've experienced what he's experienced. He sees that I've experienced the same and it deepens our relationship. Is it fun? Do you want to go through it? Absolutely not. We're not masochistic. That's not the idea. It's just that there's a dynamic to it that, that God says, uh, Jesus says, that it's a blessing. There's an intrinsic, internal, divine joy, even in something like that. And he, he tells us a, a few reasons why. Because God can give us a peace in the midst of it that passes all understanding. Uh, we can expect a reward in heaven. That's what he says here in the, in the Beatitudes. In the midst of it, now we're not talking about persecuting because you're a jerk. You know what I mean? I mean, don't, you know, it's not because you do stupid stuff and people don't like you. That's not what we're talking about here. Sometimes we kind of bring this stuff on ourselves. I don't know why he, the person doesn't like me. <laughs> Let me explain it to you. Uh, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about because of your faith in Christ, because of being a witness for Jesus Christ and so forth, uh, you're being persecuted. Uh, you can be and see a blessing in it because you will receive a reward in heaven. We can also take courage, knowing that God will work all things together for good. Not my immediate good, not my immediate deliverance, but for his kingdom and his purposes. And uh, uh, with that in mind, I, I wanted to close with a, a story of a guy named John Howard. John Howard is, is probably a name you've never heard of before. He lived in the area, era, it was a contemporary with William Carey, John and Charles Wesley, you know, George uh, Whitfield, uh, great preachers and missionaries and so forth. He was a contemporary, uh, and he was um, uh, a, a noted Christian of his, of his day. Now, I want to read uh, a prayer he wrote to you, and I'll have it on the screen. I want you to read it along with me and, and think about it. He's 24 years old. Uh, he's been around Christianity, obviously, growing up in London in the late 1700s his whole life. But here's the breaking point. Here's where he becomes the genuine disciple. Uh, and, and as I read this, think about, is this a guy that is, is sorrow over his sin, that is broken, that is no self-sufficiency, is looking for God's mercy, that is hungering and thirsting after righteousness? And then we'll talk about, and then was, did things work out in his life and how God used him here in a moment? But this is, this is what he prayers. You, you tell me if this is a, a beatitude kind of a prayer. He says, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Here on this sacred day in the dust before the eternal God, I cast my guilty and polluted soul on the sovereign mercy of the Redeemer. O oh, compassionate and divine Lord, save me from the dreadful guilt and the power of sin and accept my solemn, free, unreserved surrender. Look upon me, a repenting, returning prodigal. Thus, O oh Lord God, am I humbly bold to covenant with thee ratify and confirm it and make me the everlasting monument of thy mercy. That's a great line. 
Make me a monument of your mercy. Is he concerned about God's glory uh, or his own well-being? I think he's concerned about God's glory. Glory to God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost forever and ever. Amen and amen. Well, John prayed that prayer, and God began to work, and within three years, his wife died. Uh, because of the death of his wife uh, and uh, the mourning uh, over her, uh, right at the same time, there was a, a, a huge earthquake in, in Portugal and Lisbon, and thousands died. And there was a tremendous plea for anyone that can come uh, and, and help. He was a guy of some means and now unattached. And in his mourning, he decided that this is what the Lord would want him to do, being this beatitude kind of broken person before the Lord, pursuing after righteousness. So in Christ's name, he boards a ship in London. He sails for Lisbon. England and France are at war at that time, and a French missionary, uh, mercenary ship uh, boards them. They grab him and throw him in the, uh, in the, uh, in the bottom of the ship, sail to France, and, and throw him uh, in a hell he cannot imagine. Uh, in, in prisons in those days, all over Europe and in England, uh, you got no food, no water, and no sunlight. I mean, it was... It was incredibly gross, it was incredibly filthy, and you had no idea when you would ever see the light of day again. And that's, that's what he's going through. Well, eventually, he's moved from one prison to the next, and then he gets out on a prisoner exchange with a French officer, and, and he is freed. He goes back to London, uh, and he begins to talk about what prisons were like. And then he goes and starts to visit them. And he visits every prison uh, in London. And he writes about it. How big they are. How many square foot. How much filth is on, on the ground. How little food for the women, for the men. Everything that they're going through. He meets guys that have stolen three or four dollars. And they've been in prison for six years. No trial. No nothing. They're just there rotting away. His book is published. He testifies before parliament. They begin to enact some changes. He goes all over Europe. Uh, doing, doing the same, uh, looking at prisons, writing, speaking about them. He's kind of the William Wilberforce, what he did for slavery, John Howard did in terms of uh, prisons in, uh, in Europe. Ravi Zacharias writes about it in his uh, really very fine book, uh, The Grand Weaver. I just want to lead a, uh, read a little quote from him. There's a great, great line that, uh, that he ends this on. He says, no one, perhaps especially Howard himself, could have guessed what would happen in his soul during those few short hours in prison in answer to this prayer. In the years to come, he would stand before parliaments and rulers and lawmakers until he changed the course of history. In Europe, nation after nation introduced prison reform bills. His impact was felt in the Bastille, <clears throat> the French galleys, the prison of the Spanish Inquisition, and the Lazarettos of Turkey. As a tribute to his service, his statue was the first to be placed in St. Paul's Cathedral in London. When you read his journal, you see notation after notation of a desire that his name not be exalted, but that his cause never be forgotten. He wanted to be a monument to God's mercy. Reading about such a life as his makes any desire on our part to be number one, frankly, pathetic. John Howard found his calling and what led him to it? A death, a terrible earthquake, a war in a putrid jail cell of a mercenary vessel. Was he blessed in the midst of the persecution? Did God use his life tremendously? Would he have it any other way? Yeah, even a difficult, it can be tremendous blessing because of an intrinsic joy, a calling, a satisfaction in the heart of the genuine disciple. It starts by, man, <clears throat> real, I'm poor. <laughs> Seriously, I'm a beggar. There's nothing in me worthwhile. I sorrow over my sin. Did you hear that in his prayer? That was a good prayer. <laughs> that was a really good prayer. Uh, do, you, do you get a sense in reading these, these prayers sometimes? These guys aren't quite sure that God's going to forgive them. They're just kind of banking on it and just praying for mercy. That's a good way to pray. You think God hears that kind of prayer? I think he does. I think sometimes in our American culture, it's like, well, I got a right to this. God's got to. <laughs> that's, not, that's not a good, good way <laughs> to pray. I think it's much more, oh God, if you will, oh merciful God, you forgave this, will you forgive this also? 
Boy, is that a guard against pride. Lord, help me hunger and thirst for righteousness sake. I know that's where the real, the real blessing. Lord, I want to be a peacemaker. Be pure in heart, a singleness towards you. Lord, will you work that in me? Will you fill me with your righteousness, your spirit, so that I can be a, a genuine disciple, so that you can show me now, we can talk about conduct and how I carry out the affairs of, that you've given me to do, because we all have a, a calling, a ministry, a purpose uh, in, in this life. Uh, it's just amazing what, what he goes through. Uh, and yet, uh, that last line, what did it take? It took a death, it took an earthquake, it took a war, it took a jail, with, uh, you know, that was radical. But I think in the end, he'd go, it was a blessing. Who is like you, Lord of heaven, King of glory, throne in majesty? You are holy, you are holy. Who can fathom all the riches of your mercy, of your faithfulness? You are worthy, you are worthy. My great Redeemer's praise The honors of His name Awake my soul and celebrate The wonders of His grace Let heaven and earth join in the song Who is like you? Who is like you? Lord of heaven, King of glory, throne in majesty, you are holy, you are holy. Who can fathom all the riches of your mercy, of your faithfulness, you are worthy, you are worthy.
can I do for you? You have explained every mystery. What can I do for you? Soon as a man is born, you know the sparks begin to fly. He gets wise in his own eyes, and he's made to believe a lie. Who would deliver him from the death he is born to die? Well, he'll give it all, and there's no mourning one can pretend to do. What can I do for you? can I give to you? You have given me a life to live. How can I live for you? I know all about poison. I know all about fiery darts. I don't care how rough the road is. Show me where it starts. Whatever pleases you, Lord, tell it to my heart. Well, I don't deserve it, but I sure did make it through. What can I do for you? You have, you have given all there is to give. What can I give to you? How can I live for you? I know all about poison. I know all about fiery darts. I don't care how rough the road is. Lord, show me where it starts. Whatever pleases you, Lord, tell it to my heart. Well, I don't deserve it, but I sure did make it through. What can 